All right. Beginning in verse 41, Matthew 22, and we'll read through verse 46. While the Pharisees were gathered together, I just find this quite interesting. It's, you know, Jesus, Jesus doesn't just walk away. While they're gathered together, he asked them, Jesus asked them, saying, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, without missing a beat, the son of David, or you see the son is in a, well, in my copy is properly in italics because it's not actually in the original. Actually, the idea is he's of David. The son of David is at, the son of is added for clarification and nothing wrong with that. He said to them, how then does David in the spirit call him Lord? Saying, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare question him any more. So Jesus has, has just fielded three consecutive questions from the Pharisees, Sadducees, and a lawyer of the Pharisees. And so they're in cahoots. They don't agree with one another. They don't necessarily get along, but they are in cahoots against, against Jesus. And of course, his answers, as we have seen, highlight, highlighted fundamental truths. At the same time, spoiling their attempts to undermine his character, and turned the crowds against him. And so now Jesus, I guess we could say, turns the table. It's now his turn to ask a question. Now, these religious leaders don't deny the Christ. They don't deny the coming of Christ. And by the way, the Christ is simply the Messiah. All Jews anticipated one whom Jehovah in their minds, Jehovah would raise up this person and he was going to lead the nation. He was going to lead in the restoration of national prominence for Israel. And he was going to be a participant in destroying all of their enemies. And by the way, they get this from the Old Testament scriptures. So these, these guys aren't ignorant of the Bible in one sense. But they didn't understand it. You see, Jesus did not fit their concept of Messiah. He did not present himself as a mighty warrior. Remember, we talked about this a few weeks back. He didn't come riding in on a white horse. He will. But that's not how he came the first time. He came into Jerusalem, remember, lowly, sitting upon a donkey accessible, approachable. He was a servant. He denied himself and he had compassion upon the multitudes, even Gentiles. He healed and he preached and he did mighty works that set him apart. But one thing he didn't do is he did not join the religious elite. In fact, he called them out. And that didn't go so well. That didn't set well with them. But the point I'm making here is that, is that Jesus did not meet their expectation. And Jesus knew what their expectation was. And he knew that the common expectation of the Jews did not fit the true identity of the Christ, the Messiah, that Jehovah announced through the prophets. Oh, the Messiah would indeed be a king who would reign and would ultimately conquer all the enemies of his kingdom. The, the Psalms are, are loaded with that emphasis, as are the prophets. But the Messiah would also be a suffering servant of Jehovah. That also was prophesied, wasn't it? 
especially in Isaiah, but he's not the only one that spoke of, of that. So it, it's in this context that Jesus poses the what I am calling the greatest question of all. Jesus doesn't say that. But look at the question. Verse 42, what do you think about the Christ whose son is he? Now, while Jesus doesn't say that he is the Christ, this is certainly the implication, isn't it? And, and they at least suspect that this is his claim because a couple of days after this, I'm turning over to Matthew 26 here. They're going to actually question him about this. So this is what, this is what they're perceiving him. And so in Matthew 26, verse 63 of 64, Jesus, no, 63, Jesus kept silent and the high priest, this is when he was on trial. The high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ. Tell us if you are the Christ the Son of God. Jesus said to him, it's as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the power and coming in the clouds of heaven. They accused him of blasphemy and he deserved to die. But the answer, coming back to our text, the answer to the question that Jesus asks is fundamental to Christianity. By the way, propositional truth is absolutely essential. Okay? Jesus is who he is. What the Pharisees or what you and I think does not alter the truth. But what you think about the Christ and your relationship to him is vital to your relationship with the living God. The Christ. The Christ is the revelation of the true and living God. You remember earlier, Jesus asked his disciples, he asked the question differently. He says, who do you say that I am? He doesn't ask that here. Here he says, what do you think of the Christ? But to his disciples who were committed to following him, he says to them, who do you say that I am? And you know Peter's answer. You are the Christ, the son of the living God, or more literally, the son of the God, the living one. But of course, the Pharisees, at least as a group, and when we talk about the Pharisees, as we will when we get into chapter 23, the scribes and the Pharisees, we're talking about them as a group. They're they're they're. Very, very probably, I'm saying probably were individual exceptions, but as a group, they did not see Jesus as the Christ. And so here, Jesus is graciously confronting them a final time. And I, and I say it this way because the graciousness is going to end after this. In chapter 23, we're going to come upon a series of woes upon this group of people. But it hasn't been pronounced yet. He is still gracious toward them. I think in a sense he is still appealing to them. As he asked them the very question that he asked them. In our passage. Jesus asked this question. Knowing what the Pharisees believed. He knew how they would answer. They believed that Messiah or the Christ. Would come from David's lineage. And so it was no shock when. They answered in verse 42, son of David, the son of David. Jesus didn't, he wasn't taken back by that. He wasn't alarmed by that. He knew that's what they would say. You remember the crowds in Jerusalem had just shouted, just what a day or two before? They had shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. And the reason they shouted that is because there was at least some perception that he was the Christ because that was an identifier of the Messiah, the son of David. But the Pharisees and scribes objected to that claim back in 
chapter 21 and verse 15, but when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were incensed. They were indignant. They rejected that claim. So the problem was not that they believed that Christ was the son of David. And I say that because there are actually some people who read Jesus' words here as if he is rejecting that. No, I'm not the son of David. That's not who I am. Which I hope you can see is a total misunderstanding of what Jesus is saying. He's not saying, I'm not the son of David. The problem wasn't that they said that he was the son of David. The problem was that was all they said, and they only believed this about the Christ. And furthermore, they did not see Jesus to be the Christ. So there's two things going on here. Jesus is expressing who the Christ is, but he is also really expressing who he is. And so he turns them to Psalm 110 to identify the Christ more fully. Who is the Christ? And does it really matter? Does it really matter? And the answer is absolutely. There, there is really nothing that matters more. Now, there's no argument that the Christ is the son of David. So we don't need to spend time on that part of well, I guess we could say the equation. In other words, Jesus doesn't turn to passages like 2 Samuel 7, 12 and 13, or Psalm 89, or other such references in the Old Testament to prove the, the Davidic lineage of the Christ. That much is, is given. That much is assumed that the Christ is truly of the lineage of David. In other words, he is truly a man in the fullest sense of the word. Yes, he is the son of David. Yes, his human genealogy can be traced back to David. And of course, Matthew's already done that, hasn't he, in the first chapter of this gospel. So we conclude, and we conclude this with these Pharisees, the Christ or the Messiah is, is a man. Right? He's a man. But that's not the complete truth about the Christ. And so Jesus doesn't go to those scriptures. He goes to Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And you, you heard in the reading of Psalm 110, what is it? Verse 4 he refers to Melchizedek, right? So you know Psalm 110 is something bigger, something greater, something beyond David. In fact, I say, again, you may not know of some of these things, and so some of the things I say I may not even need to say, but Jesus does not defend the Davidic authorship of Psalm 110. There are those who actually question the the the, the legitimacy of the Davidic authorship of 110. So they, what they say is somebody else is writing that about King David. But the Jews commonly believed this to be a messianic psalm. Jesus knew this. David is not speaking of himself. This is why Jesus chooses this psalm. And by the way, you may not know this. This is fairly significant, I think. Psalm 10 is the most quoted psalm. The most quoted, excuse me, it's the most quoted of any Old Testament scripture reference in the New Testament. Psalm 110. And we're not going to look at all of them, all of them today, but we will look at it. We will reference a few of them because this is, this is really quite significant. And so what Jesus says about Psalm 110 is fascinating to me, and it's eye-opening. We're really hearing his interpretation of Psalm 110. You notice what he says in verse 43. He said to them, How then does David in the Spirit call him Lord? 
Now, you could read that with a small s, because it's the same word in the Greek. And so the context is what determines whether it's a big S or small s. But we are helped by Mark's account, because Mark actually says, Holy Spirit. And so we don't have to guess at what Jesus meant. He is saying that David, in the Spirit or by the Spirit, called him Lord. David was speaking with insight that was given him by the Holy Spirit. Now, all of Scripture is... The Holy Spirit guided every author in Scripture, to, we heard this in the last hour, to, to, to write. So it doesn't matter what, what Scripture it is, it's God's Word, right? We, we know that. We know that. But there's a point of emphasis here. That whatever David is saying, he is saying with a Holy Spirit given insight. Jesus is saying that David is recording words spoken by God to God. He's not guessing at this. He's not, he's not trying to dream up some new theology here. The Holy Spirit is the one that is communicating this through David. What was communicated? The Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, the Lord said to my Lord, Adonai. Those are two names that are used of God in the Old Testament scriptures. And so David is saying, the Lord, Yahweh, said to my Adonai, my Lord. The Spirit gave David insight into the eternal counsel. Think about that. Communication of the Lord to the Lord. The communication of Yahovah to Adonai. And it could have been Yahovah to Yahovah. It could have been Adonai to Adonai. It could have been, it could have been because, because the one is equal with the other, right? This is the communication and the relationship of the eternal God. These are words of the Father to the Son. And if you question that, then I, I refer you to Hebrews chapter 1. And we can depend upon another authority to substantiate this. In Hebrews chapter 1, you know that's a passage where, where the apostle is, is, is saying that the Son is greater than the angels. And, and he's giving a number of different quotations from the Old Testament scriptures to validate the point that the that that, that it's to the Son that God says it's, it's to the Son that the Father says such and such, right? And then you get down to verse 13 and he says, But to which of the angels has he ever said? Jehovah's Witnesses, are you listening? To which of the angels has he ever said? Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. This is, this is the Father said this to the Son, and He said this in eternity. He didn't say this after the creation. This is, this is what, this is the eternal counsel, the eternal wisdom speaking. He says, sit at my right hand. Which, of course, is a reference to the exalted Lord, Messiah. That's not a reference to David. Psalm 110 is not about David. It is about the Christ. Now, again, the Jews believe that. That's what makes what Jesus says here so significant. They believed that. Jesus' point is that David called the one whom the Jews recognized to be the Christ. What did he call him? What did David call the one whom the Jews recognized to be the Christ? My Lord. That's what he said. My Adonai. 
Think about that. What does that tell you? It tells you that he already existed. Do you get my point here? David saying by the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to, not my future Lord, to my Lord right now, my Lord, sit at my right hand until, until I make your enemies your footstool. Based upon this, Jesus sets forth the riddle that the Pharisees cannot or do not answer in verse 45. If, maybe we, R.C. Sproul, he likes to say since when he comes, but no, the Bible says if, if David then calls him Lord, and he did, how is he his son? How can the Christ be the son of David when David calls him Lord? And he's, and he's Lord right then. He's Lord. My Lord. He's calling him my Lord then. How can he then call him his son? So he is his Lord positionally, and that's typically what everybody thinks about, and that's true. He is his Lord positionally. So he is more than a son in that sense. He's, he's, but this is what struck me. He calls him Lord before he became his son. I never saw that until actually last night. That seems huge. So there's something about this one, the Christ, that is pre-existing. Psalm 110 and verse 1 is the truth given by the Spirit. If it is... If we conclude that, and these Jews would have said, yes, we believe that's the word of God. So if you're interacting with a Jew or you're acting, interacting with anyone, you say, do you believe the Old Testament scriptures are the word of God? They say, yes, then you, 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 you've got something to hang your, your discussion on as you're trying to demonstrate to them who the Christ is. If this is true, then the Christ must be both David's Lord already existing and David's son. So, whoever the Christ is, and you, you, if you notice that Jesus has not said he's the Christ, he doesn't say that here. That's kind of been something that he's sort of hidden during his ministry. And he doesn't come right out and say it here. Whoever the Christ is, he must be David's Lord, and also of David's seed. In other words, he must be the root and the offspring of David. The Christ, the Christ, the Messiah, must be one from whom David came and is Lord of all, and also the offspring or descendant of David. Well, then here's the million dollar question. Who is he? Who is this Christ? We need to identify. If these things are true, who among humanity, who in the human race fits this description of the Christ? And brethren, I know you already know the answer, but they didn't know it. Jesus is the answer to the riddle. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son Jesus is standing here identifying himself in an essence saying, I'm the answer to the riddle that I'm giving to you. He is the Christ. He is the perfect union of God and man in one person. He is David's Lord and David's son. I 
quoted it a moment ago. There are people, there are some religious groups who say that Jesus didn't claim some of the things that we say are true about him. Well, listen to Jesus' words in Revelation 22 and verse 16. I, Jesus. So we're asking, who is this Christ? I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. I am. I am. The Apostle Paul began the Roman letter. This is how important this is. He begins the Roman letter, which is, which is an unfolding of, of, of so much of the, the depths of the gospel. Which, by the way, you know, there is nothing shallow about the gospel. It, it has depths that I have not plummeted, nor have you. But this is where he begins. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, Romans 1 verses 1 through 4. A bondservant of Jesus Christ. Called to be an apostle. Separated to the gospel of God. Which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh the son of David and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. He is not only the son of David, he's the son of God. And as the son of God, he is that eternal one to whom the father was speaking. The Lord said to my Lord, you see, he's David's Lord. Okay. Why does it matter? Now, I say up to this point, we could just say, well, that's interesting. That's fascinating. I, I see the connection, but so what? Well, there's a lot of things that can be said. So let me just set some thoughts before you that I'm taking as a kind of coming out of what of Psalm 110 and verse 1 and seeing how it unfolds in the, in the New Testament. But uh, let me begin here. And it's this, that the Christ, the Christ came to accomplish far more than the Jews anticipated. This, this is why it matters who he is. I suppose in some sense you could say, if, if the Christ was only going to accomplish what the Jews anticipated, well, a son of David would have worked. You see, it, it, but, but if Jesus is only a descendant of David after the flesh, then he is as limited as any other created being. He might be a superman. He might accomplish mighty feats like a Roman emperor or a Napoleon. But he could not defeat the devil who had power over death. You understand the mission of the Christ is monumental, it's eternal. It is not just about this life. He would never, he would never have entered into glory and he never would have established an everlasting kingdom with all of those that the Father gave him and that was prophesied. The fact of the matter, if the Christ were only of the seed of David, the Messiah would, would fail. And I thought about this, that how would Revelation read, Aaron? How would, how would Revelation read if he were only the seed of David? I mean, think about that. Revelation would be totally rewritten. It, it, it wouldn't look like the lamb, the lamb would not conquer. The end wouldn't be as Revelation leads us to understand. No, the Christ of whom David spoke by the Spirit is the one to whom Jehovah said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So who can we say that Jesus was slash is the Christ. Was he the anointed 
of Jehovah. Was he the one David was speaking about? This one called Jesus. There was plenty of doubt. Now, now for you and I, you know, we said we, 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 we know that. All. Listen, there was plenty of doubt. And I'll guarantee you, if you get out beyond your, you know, your own, um, I heard a guy call it your mental universe, your mental universe. You're going to find that there's a lot of people who question. And it's not going to be too many days after Jesus says what he says here, that these disciples, these disciples are going to scatter because they think it's over. Right? And so in Psalm 110, this is why it's critical that Jesus referred to Psalm 110 and why it's repeated over and over in the New Testament because David was seeing beyond the suffering and the cross to the glory of his exaltation. But beloved, the Christ of whom the prophets testified had to do something first. He had, he had to first suffer, didn't he? And it didn't look like he was that one sitting at the right hand. Because at that point, he wasn't. Psalm 110 is prophetic. We have Isaiah 53, which prophesied, well, more than Isaiah 53, but the suffering servant, those suffering servants, those servant songs, as they're called in Isaiah, are worked out in the life of Jesus so that when Jesus rose from the dead. You remember this as he's talking to the two on the road to Emmaus. And they don't see who he is. And they're, they're, they're mystified by what just happened. The one that they had such great hopes in died. He was crucified. And Jesus says in Luke 24, 25 and 26, he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ. By the way, the Christ or the word Christ, you'll find it 500 and some odd times in the New Testament. It's the word, the name Jesus is nearly a thousand times. And sometimes they're combined, not always. Obviously. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Sit. Sit at my right hand. Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Who, who is this? Who is David talking about? Is he talking about himself or is he talking about another? That's what was asked of the reading of Isaiah, right? In Acts chapter 8. Well, flip over to Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, Peter's preaching a message and he quotes from David. And in verse 33, pick up the message of Peter here. Therefore, being exalted, God raised him up. Verse 32 says, we're, we're witnesses to this. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God. Sit at my right hand. And having received from the Father the promise of the Spirit, He poured out this which you now see and hear. He is mediating the kingdom. We could say the Father's kingdom. We could say Christ's kingdom. I don't think we would be stretching it to say the spirits, it's God's kingdom. For David did not ascend into the heavens. But he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, 
whom you crucified, both Lord and, and Christ. Brethren, the Father anointed His Son, the Christ, who had humbled Himself. And He took upon Himself the form of a bond servant. That was the outworking of the eternal counsel, the covenant between the Father and the Son and the Spirit. He humbled Himself. To take on the form of a bond servant. He came in the likeness of men. That's interesting. Not just the likeness of a man, but of men. Humanity, you see. The likeness of men. And he did that to live and die the death of the cross. And you know Paul's words. He said, after saying those things, therefore God also has highly exalted Him and given Him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If Jesus were not the Christ, of whom David, by the Holy Spirit, spoke, then, then his death would have ended the charade. Right? The, the, they, they, they said he was an imposter. They didn't believe he was who he claimed to be. And had he, had he been overcome by that death, and that were the end, then the charade would have been over. His enemies would have been correct. Religion would have kept the world in darkness. The power of Satan, darkness, sin, death, and hell would have continued to reign. There would have been no victory. And as I said before, revelation would be a wash. Scrub it out. It doesn't matter. But he is the Christ, the God-man, able as man to die and able as God to destroy the works of the devil and lead many sons to glory. I hope you sense the excitement of that. If you are in union with Christ, may the Spirit of God knit your heart right now in a very sensitive way to the reality of what is yours in Christ. You see, if Christ, if the Christ, if Jesus is the Christ, then sin and death do not win. And all we know right now, right now, just as David said by the Holy Spirit, he is seated at the right hand of his father. Because he, as the Christ, successfully purged our sins by Himself on the cross and is seated. Right? Hebrews 1 and verse 3. Right now, He is ruling with authority over all things. That, that ought to breathe some hope into your maybe troubled soul. He is ruling with authority. Whatever you see going on in the world, this one, the Christ... Jesus is ruling with all. He's the sovereign Christ. He is ruling over all things given to him by his Father. Isn't that what he prayed in John 17 and verse 2? And why? Why? Why is he ruling just, just to be ruling? No. No, it's to give eternal life to as many as the Father has given to him. Nothing's going to stop that. Nothing's going to prevent that. Jesus the Christ is seated and He is ordering all things. Now, Jehovah said to Adonai, the Father says to the Son, sit. It's, it's, it's accomplished, Son. Sit. Sit at my right hand. Until I make your enemies your footstool. 
And what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15? You see, Jesus Christ will, and, and, you know, some of this is, you know, it's, it's, it's language that, that uh, genders the idea of authority and the idea of relationship. Is he literally seated on a literal constructed throne, etc.? I, I, no, no, but th this is the position. And he is in this relationship to his father, mediating, ruling, overseeing, ordering all things now until the end. First Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 22, for as in Adam all die. Even so, in Christ, all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. Father, here it is. Here it is. When he puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power, and everything that has been a contradiction to God and his purpose for his people. For he must reign. Psalm 110 1, till he has put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. So, so if, if, if today, if you feel yourself gasping for your last breath, remember this. You're facing your last enemy. But it's conquered. It's overcome. It's overcome by this one who is the Christ. And believer, think about this even now. You don't have to wait till you're gasping your last breath. Listen, even right now, do you understand right now? You are seated with him in heavenly places. And I know that's a mystery to our minds. But that's how secure you are. Your life is hidden. With Christ, which kind of tells me this, that. That everything about your life has not yet come to full fruition. Everything that is yours in Christ has not yet been fully realized. It's hidden with Christ in God. But what we can say about that is what is his is yours. And this is true because Jesus the Christ is David's Lord and David's son. In Christ and Christ in you. You reign with him. You reign with him. Kings and priests. Isn't that what Revelation says? It begins that way. You have been made kings and priests or a kingdom of priests. It can be read more than one way. But it's because of him and your relationship in, in him. Well, the Pharisees and the scribes were silenced. They weren't able to answer him a word. Nor from that day on did anyone dare question Jesus anymore. They had no answer to Jesus' riddle. They didn't believe that he was the Christ. Now, if they continued as they were, they would face Jesus the Christ as his enemies. Till I make your enemies your footstool. And I would say, don't be like them. Believe in this one who is speaking here. Believe in him. Bow before him. Follow him. It really does matter how you respond to Jesus the Christ, doesn't it? Are you responding? My soul has been responding as I've studied this. I have, my soul has been, I have been, I have been, I have been reach, I have been receiving and I have been going to him and I've been worshiping him and I've been communing with him and I, I hope you will do the same thing. It matters that you believe that he is God man. 
Because you see, there's no other Savior. There's no other mediator. There is no other way to be reconciled to God. That's God's way. Someone, you know, you might say, well, you know, preacher, we, all, we, we, we believe all this already. Well, I, you know, maybe you do, maybe you don't. I don't know. But you need to be grounded in these things. I got a phone call this past week. Interesting. It's, it just amazed me. I was actually preparing for a class to teach the Haitians and and I was I had my Bible open to Matthew 16 because I was it was unrelated to what this message is about. But I had my Bible open to Matthew 16 and I was looking at the very verse that all of a sudden my phone rang private number. And I thought, well, I don't usually answer calls that I don't know who they are, but for some reason, I, you know, hello. And as soon as I said hello, I thought, why did I do that? You know, but hello. Yes, uh, I'm I'm uh, looking for uh, uh, somebody that in the church that's a Bible teacher or the pastor, somebody that's in leadership. I said, well, I'm, I'm the pastor. Oh, well, good. I have a Bible question. I said, you know, I, I was reading Matthew 16. Uh, he said, I, do, do you have a Bible there? You could turn to it. I didn't tell him I had my Bible open to it. I just let him talk, you know. And he there was a point that he I'm not going to I'm not going to prolong the engagement that I had with him. But this is the point that I'm wanting to make. See, I was trying to listen to what, what, what point was he getting at? He, I said, are you, is this a serious question? Are you really honestly asking me questions? He said, yeah, I'm on, I'm on my lunch break and I'm reading my Bible. I just wanted to, I came across this. Well, it became very clear that what, that really was not true. Because ultimately he came to this. If he, the one that Peter confessed, if he is the Son of God, and so if he is the eternal Son of God, how could he die? And so I said, and of course I knew, you know, I hadn't fully entered into the preparations of my message for today, but I knew I, I, I knew the Scriptures. And, and so I began to try to answer his question, but then... He started ramping up his opposition to the point where I couldn't continue the conversation. There are plenty of religious people who deny the gospel. And let me ask you, if, if he is the eternal son of God, how could he die? How could? Well, isn't the mystery solved by the incarnation? The uncreated God joined himself with created man. And those aren't just theological facts. That's an incredibly significant reality. David's Lord became David's son. And he alone is able to deliver us from the bondage of sin and death unto a glorious freedom with him now and forever. Beloved, we're going to reign with Him. We're reigning now, but we're going to reign with Him forever. New heaven, new earth, forever. If you are in Christ, what do you think about the Christ? There really is no greater question to answer than that. May the Holy Spirit who pressed David to write what he wrote, press us. To really grasp and appreciate who the Christ, our Lord Jesus, is and who we are in Him because of Him. Father, I thank You.